You got the clicker. I got All the right. clicker. Amen. I've been looking forward to this. Um, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity that you gave me to spend three weeks in the Philippines with your choice servants. And, and Father, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd help me be able to communicate what you're doing there. And I pray that you'd bless. I also pray that you'd help Brother Peach in Peru. And Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If we could uh, dim the lights, I'll get started right away with the PowerPoint. All right. Um, I left on January the 8th. I think I had to be at the airport like at 3.30 in the morning. Um, bless Nikki's heart. And then I got back on the 29th. It was right at midnight. So, I mean, it was full. But I praise the Lord for the opportunity to be able to take this trip and to uh, visit our missionaries. I had some goals that I wrote down that I wanted to accomplish. Uh, I wanted to encourage Amber and, of course, love on her. It had been two years since I'd seen her. And I wanted to encourage and thank Heavenly Bible Baptist Church. Yes. I got used to using this in the Philippines. I, I almost like it, except for the cord. You have to do a dance with the cord. I, I wanted to thank Heavenly Bible Baptist Church um, and Pastor Rusty and, and Lita because they just embraced Amber for two years and helped her get on her feet, help her learn the culture, had patience with her as she grew in the Lord and in the culture, and uh, I wanted to encourage them. Also, I wanted to understand a couple of the other orphanage ministries there since Amber is interested in working in an orphanage. Um, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but uh, um, that was a goal. And also to encourage and spend time with Knapp and Shirley Donato and with a uh, group that we have with BIO. I'll explain a little bit more going on. They call themselves Baptist International Outreach of the Philippines in the island of Negros, in, on uh, Negros Oriental and Occidental. And I wanted to spend time with our missionaries, Kevin and Joanne Trout. They also have a children's home in Mindanao. And uh, I, I believe that through your prayers, the Lord enabled me to reach every one of those goals. And, you know, I've taken a lot of trips around the world, but uh, I can't remember a trip, I think, that was more blessed than this trip. My prayer was that God would go before me, go before Amber and I as we traveled everywhere. And I felt that. Uh, evidently, I felt that very clearly. So, oh yeah, Pastor Mark told me, got to point at the camera there. All right. All right. Uh, those pictures might be a little small, uh, but it was so good. Uh, would it be better if you dimmed the lights just a little bit? I want everyone to be able to enjoy the pictures. Um, it was so good. I don't know who took that picture, but that was the first hug that I had with Amber in two years. And it was so good just to spend time with her and to see what God is doing through her. Um, you, you can see that she looks a little bit different there in that picture. Um, she has lost 100 pounds, and uh, she has taken up Muay, Muay Thai, if I'm saying that right. It's, it's uh, kickboxing in Thailand. Um, she has grown spiritually. Um, I, I, she let me have her room with the air conditioner in it, which I am most thankful for. But having um, her room, I also had proximity to her prayer closet. And just that alone was enough to bless me as a father, to see her walking with God and growing. Uh, she uh, is growing spiritually and, and in the culture and the language Everywhere we went, she used Tagalog, and uh, they were all surprised because they saw two Americans walking up and, and hear uh, the, one of them speaking in pretty good Tagalog. Um, but she's really growing in the language and the culture, and everywhere I went, everyone said, oh, she's a Filipina now. She's a Filipino now, and that was a real blessing. Um, you'd be proud of, of Amber and how she's grown in the Lord. Um, she was excited to see... There we go. She was excited to see the suitcase I brought. I actually brought about 100 pounds of goods for Amber. Now, it wasn't all for Amber, 
Uh, some of it was for uh, medical missions outreach. I had a whole bunch of boxes of antibiotic ointment and things like that, but over 100 pounds of stuff. And uh, she is very excited to open that up once we got settled in her house. If you're looking at the next picture, um, Amber is also driving in the Philippines. And uh, at first, I was a little concerned, but then I learned I, uh, the first time I sat in the car and she started turning, and the rule of thumb there is if you got the guts, you go. Um, there's no lights, hardly. There might be a traffic enforcer during the peak hours, but there's no, there's no enforcer. And uh, these, these bikes and trikes are weaving in and out all over the place, around you, behind you. She has a camera that gives her a pretty good uh, view of everything around her. And the first time she pulls out, I went, <gasps> just a natural reaction. And she looks at me and she goes, Dad, you can't do that. <laughs> so I sat back and uh, I was just amazed, driving all the way through Manila, which is 15 million people. Uh, one, one highway through Manila is called a parking lot because you just sit there and wait. But thank the Lord they had put in some new uh, sky, skyways and things like that to help you get along, along a lot faster. But I just want to praise the Lord with you uh, as to how much Amber has grown in the Lord and uh, encourage you that way. All right. It did. All right. Um, I told Amber when I was planning on this trip, I said to Amber, I said, all right, these are my dates. I'm coming. Uh, you plan the trip. I want to see, I want to see these, these missionaries, and I listed them all out for her. And so she planned this whole trip. Uh, when I told her I was landing on Wednesday, she said, Dad, you can't land on Wednesday. I said, why? She said, because my license plate has a number on it that won't let me drive in Manila on Wednesday. But we worked it out. Two of her friends from church uh, drove and uh, we were able to sit in the back of the van and just catch up while they picked us up. And it was a good time to get to know them. But Amber planned this trip. Our first stop was in Pampanga. Actually, when we landed, I went to Batangas, which is where Heavenly Bible Baptist Church is. And Pastor Rusty, I mean, I just got off the plane. It was 40 hours of travel. Pastor Rusty texted Amber, hey, you think your dad can preach tonight? <laughs> it's like, sure. So I preached Wednesday night. And then the next day, we prepared to travel to Pampanga, which was about a three-hour drive. And that's where Knapp and Shirley is. That's where the Subic Bay Mission is. And that's where the Philippine Baptist Mission Orphanage is um, that Amber's going to work with. So we spent Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday there in Pampanga. We drove back. Uh, Sunday night after church, Brother Knapp, you'll see the pictures, had a revival. I preached in the morning, I preached in the afternoon, there was a fellowship, and then we drove back uh, after some Starbucks coffee in the SM. And then uh, we, pr we planned on Monday just to wash clothes and stage and get ready for the, the next trip. The next trip we went to was Mindanao. We had to fly, we had to fly from Manila, so we got up early in the morning on Tuesday, and Amber parked her car in a company called Park and Fly, which was really convenient, and uh, we flew to Mindanao, and we were there Tuesday, Thursday, and then Friday. Friday, we flew back to Manila, and then we flew from Manila on the same day to Negros. You can see where Negros is there, in, almost in the south, and there in Negros, we were there from Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday, we flew back to Manila and there we spent the rest of the time in Batangas, where Amber lives. So that kind of gives you the idea of where I was in the Philippines. This is the orphanage in Pampanga that Amber wants to work with. This is Brother Jeremy Ferguson, and he has been a missionary there in the Philippines for 20 years. He started that church, the New Life Baptist Church, and uh, the Lord put it on his heart about six years ago to start an orphanage. And uh, we, we visited another orphanage there. Um, I'll get to that. But Jeremy's philosophy is basically, there's a need. I'm going to try to meet it. And <laughs> there's not been a lot of planning and thought. But God is faithful, and he has over 120 kids there now. So Amber really feels 
like God is going to use her to be a blessing there, but also this is going to get her feet wet in, in orphanage ministry from the ground floor, you know, to, to the details, working with the government and things like that. Um, he's got some projects that are about to happen. He wants to, to cause more separation between the boys and the girls. He said, he said, these little boys, look at these girls. He said, we can't have any more babies around here. So he wants to work on on moving the girls further away. But this is where Amber is going to work beginning in May for a year before she comes home on her furlough. I was really impressed with him. I didn't get a chance to talk to him much before the service. He preached for about an hour and 20 minutes in Tagalog. And from what I understood, it was basically fluent. He was very good. Afterwards, he shared his heart in, his, in, in the ministry. And I really felt like uh, this was a good fit for Amber. The, the next night, th that was Thursday night, Friday night, I was invited to speak at Subic Bay Baptist Church and the Subic Bay Children's Home. Um, this is a ministry, a children's orphanage that has been in existence for about 30 years. And uh, they're, in, they co they're connected with Pensacola. Uh, their daughter had went to Pensacola and um, knew some of, our, some of our students. But this, um, this is well established. And um, the Lord has really blessed this ministry. But they have a youth night, a youth event every month. And I was invited in to speak for this youth event. And it was a really good time. Afterwards, there was a sweet time of fellowship. And I uh, was able to connect with um, the orphanage leaders. And Amber was able to connect with the orphanage leaders. And I really feel like this is a good group of people that she could reach out to for, enc for encouragement and for counsel when she goes in her ministry. The next uh, Friday, that was Friday night, Saturday afternoon, um, Nap Donato had scheduled a two-day revival at Beulah Land Baptist Church. Now, there was also other churches there, as well as the youth event. Um, Pastor Knapp has started at least four churches. One church is completely on its own, and they, they have their own fellowship. Um, it's doing really good. The Word Baptist Church, if, if you've been around here for a while, you might remember that name, the Word Baptist Church in Camachalas. But uh, two other churches that Pastor Knapp has started out from his church is the Hoville Baptist Church and the Pulang Lupa Baptist Church. Both of these churches were present in that meeting, and uh, I got to know their pastor, plus there's their pastors, plus there was at least uh, two other men there in the service that work with Knapp that Knapp is mentoring for the ministry. They, the way it happens in the Philippines is they train their men in the church, and then at the same time they're starting missions in outreach areas. And then when these men are ready and the outreaches are ready to become a church, they, they send them out there and support them and help them become established. So there was three churches that visited with us. I preached on Saturday afternoon, and then I preached Sunday morning and then Sunday afternoon. We had a wonderful time of, of fellowship with the Donatos, and uh, there, was, there was four, I believe, that trusted the Lord as salvation, plus many other, other decisions that were made. But we had a wonderful time with Knapp and Shirley. From there, we went back to uh, Amber's house, and we got ready for Mindanao. Uh, Kevin and Joanne Trout, I have known them since about the 10th grade. They grew up with me. And uh, they were sent out of a local church, and they, they really had a, 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 a sad situation that developed being sent out of their church. And so they came with bio, and uh, we've been able to help them and encourage them. And I was really thrilled to see their children's home and to see how God is using them. Um, we traveled there from the airport to the airport in Mindanao and Ozami City. And then from the airport, I got in one of those little trikes. You see that thing up there? And then from there, we went to a barge that took us across the bay. And then we walked about a half a mile to the car that they had. And finally, we made it way back in the mountains there in Mindanao. Mindanao is, is very Muslim. Uh, the gospel is very much needed there in, in Mindanao. But it was a blessing to spend time with these with, with Kevin and Joanne Trout and with, with these kids. Um, 
we, we just loved on them basically for two days. We played games. It was uh, one of the girls' birthday, so I, I went with Kevin. We went back out to civilization and uh, got some Jolly Bees. That's, that's a Filipino fast food. I ordered like uh, six bucks of chicken and a whole bunch of food. I mean, $80 worth in American money worth of food. And we just spoiled the kids and had fun with them and played games. And Amber uh, started teaching them some Muay Thai. The thing that was really, I, I guess this will be informative on, on a couple of fronts here. The thing that was really heartbreaking is that that young lady there on this side, on the key, on the keyboard side, up at the corner, Amber's teaching her how to defend herself. She was taken advantage of when she was 12 years old. And the little baby underneath that picture is her daughter. And uh, when Amber was teaching her and spending special time with her, helping her to learn how that she could defend herself or at least get away, there was a bond that was there almost immediately. But we just had a good time with the Trouts and encouraged them. They are building their missions house out of dead containers. Maybe Brother Terry knows what that means. But these are containers that are not used anymore. Um, and they're, they're really solid for earthquakes and things like that. But they're slowly building a nice little compound there and, uh, and getting more and more children to help these children that, that are not wanted there. So we really enjoyed our time there in Mindanao with the Trouts. The, on uh, Wednesday night there with the Trouts, Kevin and Joanne Trout are also starting a church, a mission there on the compound where they're at. So I was able to preach to them, and uh, we had a nice little fellowship afterwards as well. And uh, don't make fun of my, my uh, platform dress there, my flip-flops and my T-shirt there. It fit the occasion. If, if you would pray for, I don't know that I could point her out. Is there a pointer on this thing? She is sitting right. Nope. Maybe not. She's sitting there next to Joanne. Her name is Amy, which they say Ami. Uh, pray for her to be saved. She's one of their best workers, but she's still not saved. And she lives there uh, close to the compound where they work and 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 uh, live so just pray if you remember pray for Ami to be saved she listened so intently I I spoke about the great shepherd the good shepherd from Psalm 23 and uh, she was just listening very closely um, something about the Filipinos for some reason they don't want a translator because they know English but if you talk to them in English they say as a joke they say you're giving me a nosebleed meaning that you're making them think too hard. <laughs> so I learned very quickly that when I speak publicly, I have to speak slow and clear to make sure that it's not a struggle. But uh, I don't think I caused too many noses to bleed there. From Mindanao, we flew back to Manila and then over to the, the island of Negros. Um, this was such a blessing. In the early 2000s, Bio had a missionary by the name of Porfirio Alcala. And Porfirio was instrumental in starting this organization, planting several churches and a Bible institute. Shortly thereafter, the Lord called Porfirio home to be with him. And uh, we have kind of been there for them emotionally. Uh, there's a little bit of support that still continues to come to them. Um, at first, there was a lot of support that Porfirio had raised, but over the years, it had kind of dwindled down to not very much. But as a missionary, a church planning missionary, when you go to the field, the, the thing that you want to see eventually is an indigenous church planning movement. You want to see a body of believers there that, that are organized, that love the Lord together, organized on a grassroots level and that the Holy Spirit is just using to evangelize. And I have never seen a more, a better picture than the Bio Philippines. There in these pictures, one was their Friday night dress and then I believe the black shirts was their Saturday dress. I spoke to them Friday night and then Saturday. And then um, there's like, there's like 30 per pastors and church workers there. In this bio Philippines group, there's over 30 churches in Negros Oriental and Negros Occidental. 
And I know in, in preaching, sometimes we hear the word koinonia for the fellowship in Jesus Christ. But I have never experienced the koinonia like I did there. The love that they had for each other, the excitement they had for the Lord and, 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 uh, and getting the gospel out, planting churches, it was absolutely incredible. We really enjoyed our time there. Uh, I, I spoke, Amber spoke, Amber sang. Um, we had a good time on Friday night and Saturday. They went back. Many of them work up in the mountains with their church, so they left Saturday afternoon so they could get home in time to be able to minister to their people. And then... Um, Afterwards, Pastor Burgos and a few other pastors took us around to some of the churches that were close. And we visited all together, uh, I think on this day we visited four or five churches. And uh, the church people in every instance, the church people were there waiting for us with, with coffee, uh, really good coffee. Sorry, Pastor Mark. Uh, really good coffee and maybe some sweets. And the fellowship was just, again, sweet. And um, we... We got together with them, and they would, you know, bounce some things off of them or what their vision was, what they wanted to do. And, and uh, then we had a time of prayer together. We just all got together and prayed at every church. We did this. And I, I began to, to really see what God is doing on, on the ground there in, in, in Negros, Occidental and Oriental. Each one of these guys are different pastors, and, and uh, now they're all my friends on Facebook. The next on Sunday, I, I preached at uh, the Biowan City First Baptist Church, and this is uh, Pastor Burgess's church. He's the chairman of their group, the Bio Philippines, and uh, I preached for them. And uh, again, uh, just a wonderful, sweet time. Amber, Amber sang. Um, just a great church, and uh, their choirs. They love they love to sing in English. I, they have some songs that are in Tagalog, or for, for them it would be Visayan, but they love to sing in English, and I didn't mind either because I could enjoy and worship with them. After Sunday, we got back in the car again and drove up into the mountains and visited more churches and, and had more times of fellowships and uh, prayed with more pastors and encouraged them in the Lord. It was just a, a wonderful time. There are some needs there that maybe we could talk about in the future, but uh, for the most part, these guys are doing it all by leaning on the Holy Spirit of God and collectively sacrificing and giving. Uh, they really did remind me of the Macedonians that Paul referred to in uh, 2 Corinthians. We just love Negros. I wanted to throw a few more pictures in there. That, that's my friend, that carabao. That's my favorite animal in the world. You can ask me why later, but anyway, I tried to get close to him, but uh, he, he was a little leery of me. I don't know why, but Negros is actually beautiful, absolutely beautiful. You, you can see the ocean and the mountains at the same time, and, and the people um, there, their love for the Lord. We just absolutely love Negros. Amber was saying, by the time we left, Amber was like, maybe I'll need a branch of an orphanage over here. <laughs> A last flight back to Manila. By this time, I think I'm beginning to get worn out. I had to put that picture up there. Amber got me really good. Um, altogether, I think I was 10 times up and down with, with flights. But I praise the Lord again for the safety that he gave us. Uh, the, last, the last stretch there was in Batangas, back at Amber's church, where she's been for the last two years. A heavenly Bible Baptist Church in Lipa City. Uh, that's a picture of Pastor Rusty and, and Ma'am Baby Alita, their choir and their church on the Sunday morning that, that we were there. Um, uh, just a wonderful body of people. They all love Amber. Anytime Amber shows up, there's like five or six people that come running. Amber! And they also love pictures. I'm not exaggerating. I think I had over a 1,000 pictures taken of me. Not that I'm a celebrity or anything, but it's just they love pictures. Um, if you remember, I think Jay mentioned the property when he was here. The Lord has blessed Heavenly Bible Baptist Church and has given them land called Kayumungi. And, and they, it's the Brungai, Kayumungi, and they have named this piece of property Graceland. I wanted to give you this perspective first. But they use this property for everything. It's just outside of Lipa where they're at. 
and uh, they use this for everything, and you'll see that in, in the next few shots here. But this was the answer to our prayers and, uh, and some sacrificial giving, the property there at Cayumungi. The first activity that we had there was on Tuesday. We got back on Monday, and then Tuesday they had this all-day prayer and fasting fellowship. Pastor Rusty has started this ministry called Prayer and Fasting, and, and what it is is each church has a time once a week where they get together and they have preaching and testimonies and prayer requests and prayer, and um, this service, we got there at 9 o'clock, and I didn't leave until 7.30 at night. The service itself lasted about eight hours. And uh, this service was special in that it was a two-year anniversary of the prayer and fasting ministry. It has expanded now to where other pastors are having prayer and fasting in their provinces, in their barangays. And so a lot of them came together here at Cayumungi so they could celebrate the two-year anniversary of this prayer and fasting fellowship. Um, I don't know if you can tell from that picture, but there are over... 500 people in that in that building there and uh, there were at least 75 preachers from different churches that were there and uh, the Lord gave me opp opportunity to be one of the, the speakers there uh, the first thing I said was that I was going to try not to give him a nosebleed and uh, of course that was enough to break the ice and we had a good time the Lord really blessed and there was many decisions um, all those on the the bottom picture all of those on that platform, there are pastors that had come for that prayer and fasting. That was a fantastic day. And um, it was a blessing just to sit there and watch them give God glory for answer to prayers. And then for other pastors to come up and give them prayer requests to pray for. And then everyone stop right where they were and have someone come up and pray. And the whole day there's no eating, it's fasting. And just pray and seek God. It kind of reminded me of in the book of Ezra when the children of Israel stood all day, listened to the word of God and worshiped the Lord. It was just a wonderful time. And this is, this is Pastor Rusty Ocampo's ministry now. He is in his 60s, and this is his desire. Um, the Lord has also blessed him in that he has been asked to be the president of a Bible institute, and he has plans for that Bible institute also to move to Cayumungi, and some of those buildings that were in the back there, he wants to turn them into some dormitories for the Bible students. So God is really blessing this ministry, and uh, the, the money and the prayers that we have invested are well worth it, uh, and I praise the Lord for that. If you know me uh, and Nikki, we work with the kids here, and uh, the, I was really blessed by this ministry. The first picture up there on the keyboard side at the top is Amber with a couple of church workers and, the, and they're at one outreach. And in this outreach, there was about 20 kids that showed up. And it's like neighborhood Bible time. I don't know if you remember that when you were a kid. It's like a little mini vacation Bible school in your neighborhood. Well, they call these the good news outreaches. And this church, Heavenly Bible Baptist Church, has 94 of these outreaches. Now, there's no way possible for them to get them to church, so they rotate throughout the month. Once a month, one, you know, a certain section, section or sector of outreaches get brought to church, so they have the church experience. Eventually, some of these outreaches will turn into missions and turn into churches. That's just the way it's done in the Philippines, and, it, and it's working. But um, we, were, we were there, and... On Saturday, Tuesday was the prayer and fasting. Wednesday, I preached Wednesday night service. I almost missed that. Um, I preached a Wednesday night service, and the Lord laid a missions message on my heart. And uh, four people from the church came forward and declared that God was calling them into missions. And uh, that was a really sweet time, a good time. But then on, on, on Thursday, I went with Amber to this outreach and then on Saturday, we had the Children's Day. And this was the last week in January, and it was the fourth Children's Day that they had for the month of January. On this day, there was 250 children that showed up at that same facility in Cayumungi. You can see them all in the bottom uh, orchestra side picture. 
um, I was able to tell them a, a Bible lesson, a Bible story, and uh, many kids came forward for salvation. I, you know, it's hard when you're dealing with kids. Um, I don't want to even put any number with it, but I, I just had an opportunity to minister to the kids, and Amber and I judged their poster competitions, and we were just part of the whole day, and it was a lot of fun. Over 250 kids there that day. On Sunday, um, we were in church, and... Um, one of the one of the workers got up and was giving the announcements and he said now he said i want everyone to listen he said because announcements are part of worship too and i thought okay how is an announcement part of worship and then he began to read he said this week 1250 children were ministered to in our children's outreach ministries including the 250 that were at the kayamungi 1,250 kids that were ministered to that week from that church. It's not a big church. They had maybe, maybe 150 there on Sunday, maybe 200 on Sunday. But many of these outreaches are started by people in the church who have a burden for their community, and they do the outreach there where they live. And they bring them to church by paying for a jeepney to bring them to church. And, and, and the Bible clubs, the workers go out and, and things like that. It was just such a blessing to see the ministry that was happening there at Heavenly Bible Baptist Church on Saturday with these kids. I don't, uh, there we go. Um, we had a good time there at, with the church. Um, can you see that middle picture with, with me with a knife over that delicious lechon? <laughs> they also talked me into playing some basketball. Um, there was one day where we, Amber and I, had time just to get away and just relax. There's an area called Tagaytay that is a, a volcano, actually erupted in 2020, a volcano inside a lake that's inside an extinct volcano. And the area on the other side of Taal is like Pigeon Forge in the Filipino standards. You could go there and there's coffee shops and places to see and places to overlook the volcano. And that's what that bottom picture is. But it was, it was such a blessing just to spend that one day. I mean, we, I was with Amber the whole time, but to just relax and talk about her goals and her plans and her struggles. Uh, we, we had such a blessed time together there in uh, Batangas. Pastor Mark, I had those guys f just for you. Those are my bodyguards, not really. I just wanted to say thank you uh, again, properly. Uh, it, again, it was such a full trip, such a blessed trip. Um, there was at least 15 souls saved. On that Sunday morning at, uh, at Heavenly Bible Baptist Church, nine came forward for salvation. And I'm really careful about numbers. Uh, because it's the Lord that's bearing the fruit through us as we minister. But I wanted to be able to say thank you to you and let you see that God was working through the whole trip, through the souls that were saved and the four that were um, led to surrender for missions. And uh, our missionaries, the bio missionaries that may, maybe you don't know, and our missionaries that you do know, Nap and Shirley Donato, the, the Ocampos, and, and Amber, blessed and encouraged. And uh, I just want to thank you, my church, for your involvement in it and in, in helping me purchase the tickets and, and the prayers that went through. I, I got texts from many of you while I was there um, encouraging me, telling me. I have my friend Josh Black here this evening. I don't want to embarrass you, Brother Josh, but he prayed for me the whole trip. And uh, I, I really appreciate the prayers that undergirded this time that I had with the missionaries because I really believe God went before us and God blessed in, in a great way. So that is uh, the trip in and of itself. Before I move on, are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Um, the little girl that I pointed out was um, the daughter of the young lady that was taken advantage of. She's having a surgery. She has a club foot, and she's having a surgery on that foot Tomorrow, I believe, Monday, she's going in. Amber looked at it. Her name is Zephaniah, but they call her Naya for short, just like the Bible, Zephaniah. And um, she didn't like me. <laughs> I, th I think I was big and ugly. I tried to warm up to her the whole time I was there, and she was like, eh! 
It's like, okay, okay. But she's a sweetie. Zephaniah, uh, if you would pray for her. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. There are over 2 million orphans in the Philippines. And it, it, it's, it's really not on the radar of a lot of churches. And a lot of it comes from poverty, and a lot of it comes from sin. Um, there was, Brother Jeremy was telling me about some kids that came because uh, their mom got a better offer with another guy somewhere else, so she just left those kids and went to that offer, and there were these kids abandoned. Um, everywhere you go, you see these street kids running, trying to sell things. It's, it, it breaks your heart. But I think uh, ministries like Jeremy, uh, Ferguson, and uh, Subic Bay, eventually Amber's children's home that she wants to start, part of their goal is to uh, increase awareness with the churches throughout the Philippines. And Amber has, has really made a lot of contacts with pastors through this prayer and fasting ministry at Heavenly Bible Baptist Church. And, and, um, but that's, that's a real problem. In fact, my missions message when I was preaching, I, I was touching on unreached people groups and how God is using the Philippines to go into Southeast Asia to reach unreached people groups. And Amber was almost sad because she thought, I'm in the Philippines. There's churches here all over. And, and, and just like that, it was like the Holy Spirit said to her, the children are your unreached peoples. And she just started weeping and she was encouraged because that is true. Uh, it's a real need there in the Philippines. That's a good question. Thank you. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. All right, again, thank you. Um, if you would, turn your Bibles to John chapter 15. I just want to share with you a message um, that I shared there in the Philippines with the prayer and fasting group John chapter 15, and I want to talk about glorifying God by bearing fruit. When I was there in the Philippines, um, I, I like good fruit. Sometimes apples and oranges get a little boring, but, I mean, they had some wonderful mangoes. In fact, there's this one lady in Amber's church that has a side business where she dries out the mangoes, and, and then seals them, and that's like candy. They're so good. Um, I love the mangoes there. I love the little the little ladyfinger bananas. They're so sweet and so good. My, we were at the fellowship and they had food, and uh, Amber said, "Oh, Dad, you need to try that. That's laing," and I said, "Okay." Um, so I took some, and it was absolutely amazing. And I said, "Amber, do you know what this laing is?" She said, no. I said, it's the same thing as palosami in Samoa. It's the taro leaf, of that taro plant there in the bottom corner. It's the taro leaf mixed with coconut milk and certain other little spices. It's absolutely delicious. Uh, but my point in all of this, figures I talk about food, right? My point in all of this is bearing fruit, bearing fruit. As much as we enjoy fruit and harvests and fruits from our ministries, it's the Lord's desire that we would bear fruit. If you would read with me in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit. Hang on a second. I'm getting old. Every that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. 
Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Then you'll be my disciples if you bear fruit. The Lord desires that we bear fruit. And I believe in this passage, very simply, that God gives us three ways to help us bear fruit for him. Um, very quickly, first of all, we must be clean. We must be clean. In verses 1 through 3, it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. In verse 3, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. I know that in that group of disciples there, Judas was there as well. So when we talk about being clean, it's obviously that we're talking about salvation first and foremost. There's no way that we can bear fruit apart from the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. But beyond that, the Lord here is speaking about sanctification. He's talking about us bearing fruit because we are clean in that we are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. A perfect example of that would be found in Psalm 105. In Psalm 105, beginning in verse number 17, it says, He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. So there, Joseph was in prison for years, but it wasn't a waste. Joseph might have thought, what in the world is going on? What is God doing? He had those dreams. He had the word of God that God had given him. But what God was doing was God was cleaning him. God was purging him. God was sanctifying him. In John 17, 17, Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't the hard times that were cleaning Joseph. It was the word of God that was being applied to his heart and mind as he was going through the hard times. And the word of God is clear to us. The word of God says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. God works in our heart and our life. We have challenges. We have difficulties. We have hardships. But that is to cause us to draw near to him through his word and as we draw near to him through his word, he cleans us, and he makes us like Christ. He makes us like Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, in verses 25 and 26, it says, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. God is doing that for us right now as we live in this world. Just the other day we were we saw something and heard something and and Nikki said, "I hate this world. This, this world is not a good place." But as we travel through this world, it causes us to lean into the to, to the Lord. It causes us to dig into the word of God. And as we dig in and lean in, the Holy Spirit begins to transform us by the renewing of our mind, and you know what happens? We become fruitful because we are clean. I remember I had a butterfly bush. Have you ever had a butterfly bush? That thing looked like Charlie Brown's Christmas tree stuck in the ground. I thought, man, this is, I'm going to just yank this out of the ground, but I thought, no, I'm going to prune it first. So I started clipping away at it, chopping almost everything off of the thing except for one stick and a few branches and by the time spring came around, the next spring, that thing had leaves popping all over it, and there were butterflies covering it. And I thought, what a perfect illustration. We go through hard times, but when we go through hard times, it's not for us to be discouraged. It's for us to lean in to the Lord and look into his word so that he can clean us and make us like himself. If we're going to bear fruit, then we must be clean. First and foremost, we must be clean. Secondly, verses 4 through 6, we must be close. 
Verse 4 says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Remember, he had Judas there with him. But here, we learn not only if we want to bear fruit for the Lord, and so be his disciples, if we want to be fruit bearers, we not only have to be clean, but we have to be close. There's intimacy here. There's familiarity. There's a friendship. There's a closeness. You know, God is no respecter of persons, but you know, the Lord had the multitudes, and he had the 12 disciples, and then he had three that were closer, the inner circle, and then he had one that thought he was the teacher's pet. Do you know John believed he was Jesus' favorite? Who wrote the book of John? John wrote the book of John, right, by the Holy Spirit? Look what John says in John 13, 23. Flip back here. In John chapter 13, verse 23, it says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. John was writing that about himself. He said, hey, <laughs> I'm the one that Jesus loved. But that's not the only place. Look at John chapter 20 and verse 2. John chapter 20 and verse 2. He's talking about the resurrection, and he says, Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. He says, Hey, it's me. Don't forget, I'm the favorite. Though You know that disciple. You know the one that Jesus really loved. Any of you were your parents' favorite growing up? My kids always said that Amy was the favorite. <laughs> but now Abby's the favorite, of course. But, you know, the Lord has no, no favorites. But John thought he was the favorite. There's another one. Look at John 21, 20. Three times. Three times John says, it's me. I'm the one he loved. It says in John 21, 20, Then Peter, turning about, seeing it, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said three times. John said, it's me. I'm the one that Jesus loves. And the point is, we're as close to God as we want to be. And my question is, how is our intimacy with God? You know, nature even tells us that if there's no intimacy, there's no fruit. Nature teaches us that. And it's the same spiritually. Unless we're close with God and we walk with God and allow uh, the Holy Spirit to draw us closer so that we abide in him, we walk with him, that's how, we get, that's how we're close. And there's no way we can bear fruit unless we're close. We're close. We must be clean we must be close. And lastly, let's look at verse, verses 7 and 8. Verses 7 and 8, it says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. The last thing that we must be is we must be clear. We must be clear. Look at that verse again, verse number 7. If a man abide in me and my words abide in you, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Remember the Lord said that if we have faith, that we can say to the mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. I, I don't know that that any of us need to have a mountain cast into the sea. But basically what the word of God is saying is there's nothing impossible 
when we abide in Christ, anything that God calls us to do, anything God leads us to seek after for him, for his glory, can be accomplished through his power. And it happens through prayer. We have to be clear in our communication to God. Real quickly, I want to just show you one example. Turn, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. You remember the, the portion of scripture in James where it talks about Elias, Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 18. It says in, in James 5, 16 and through 18, it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Here in, in, in 1 Kings, we get a little bit of an example here of what's going on. Um, we don't read in, Sam, in chapter 17 at all that Elijah, that Elijah prayed. We don't read that. The Holy Spirit gives us that information there in, in James. But we can see the kind of prayer that took place in chapter 18. It was after the, the famine and after the context, uh, the contest on, on the mountain that Elijah came down. And it was time now, since God's people had said, the Lord, he is God, it was time to ask God to remove the, the famine. Look with me in uh, chapter 18. Beginning in verse number uh, 41. It says, And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing and he said, go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain has stopped thee not. I love what, how descriptive that is. Seven times Elijah fell on his face before God and cried, Lord, you've won now, it's time. Please send rain. And he sent his servant to look. There was nothing. Seven times. And finally, the seventh time, his servant came back and said, there, there was a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. And it's almost as if through prayer, Elijah is reaching down and pulling down the rain to the earth. Prayer. I don't understand why. God has included us in the ministry of prayer. I don't understand how necessarily, but I do know that the work of God goes forward through prayer. That's why it's, it's important for us to be here to pray together on Wednesday night and for us men to come together and pray together on Saturday morning. And that's why we started a 7 a.m. That's way too early. 7 a.m. prayer time at Bio to pray for missionaries. That's why Pastor Rusty started the prayer and fasting eight hours every Tuesday. Prayer. Because it says in verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. Then you'll be my disciples if you bear fruit. My question this evening, do you, do you want to bear fruit? Are we bearing fruit? Not manufactured fruit, but are we bearing fruit? In order to bear fruit for God's glory, we must be clean. We must allow the Holy Spirit to do the work of purging and cleaning us. Getting, a, getting every day, of course, getting, a, getting the sin off of us. Um, we, we are inundated going through this world every day with, with the corruption that's in this world getting clean every morning, but then allowing God to clean us and purge us and make us like Christ. We must be clean. We must be close. We must walk with the Lord. We must have an intimacy with the Lord. We must abide in him if we're going to bear fruit. And we must be clear. We must be actively involved in seeking God through prayer for the answers that we seek spiritually. 
if you want to bear fruit, if I want to bear fruit, then we must be clean, we must be close, and we must be clear. Again, thank you so much for your prayers. It was obvious to me and to Amber that you prayed for us, and I'm here to testify tonight that God answered your prayers. It was an absolutely fantastic trip, and there was much fruit to the glory of God. Thank you so much. Pastor Mark. Wasn't that good tonight? Uh, look, I, you know, we talk a lot about missions here, um, and we talk about praying for our missionaries and investing in faith promise. Um, and by, when I say investing, I'm talking about you giving money to missions. That's what I'm talking about. John said, be clear. So I'm being clear. This is why. This is why. People being saved, people being called into the ministry. You know, our church had, he showed you, uh, I, I crack up, when J.J. was here, I, I crack up when he tells us they named it Graceland. I said, do you know what Graceland is to the American mind? J.J., what are you doing? And he's, no, it's the property that God gave us by his grace. I'm like, well, that's not what it is here in America. So when you mention Graceland, explain what Graceland is. Our church invested in that. I, if I'm not mistaken, our church sent we sent six or seven thousand dollars to help purchase that property and that's first pictures that I've seen where it's just that that has come to fruition um, so church this is this is you in your prayers and your giving this is you investing in something that's going to matter in eternity you 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 can spend money here on this earth and you can call it investing but it's not, going to be, it's not going to matter a hill of beans in what you're buying and what you and I are spending stuff on compared to investing in the souls of people that we're never going to meet till we get to heaven. That's why we have the global focus coming up. That's why uh, Brother John goes on these trips. Brother Terry takes these trips. David Peach right now down in Peru. It's why they take these trips. It's so that when we get to heaven one day, we're going to look back and say, I should have spent more time in praying for Rusty Ocampo or for Amber Yingling. I should have invested more money than what I did in, the, in missions at, through my church. Um, there's, there's reasons for this. Somebody said, I, and I don't know who first said it, the only thing that lasts forever is the word of God and the souls of people. And what we want to do is we want to bring those two things together. We, we want to bring together. So, John, thank you for that report. That's wonderful. I was getting exhausted while you were telling about your trip. I was sitting there getting more tired. I'm like, good grief. All of that in, in really less than three weeks because so much traveling going on. Uh, thank the Lord for it. How many times did you preach total? Fourteen times um, in, I don't know, 20 different cities it looked like. Um, but thank the Lord for that. I love seeing that uh, bio of the Philippines. That's a great picture. What a, uh, what a wonderful thing. Um, you know, and that brother that started all that is in heaven. And I'm trusting that God just gives him some, gives him an insight of what's going on, what he started. You can be involved in this, church. You, you can be involved in this. In your prayers and in your giving, you're bearing fruit that John is talking about here tonight. I'm, man, that's encouraging. Um, you have any more questions for Brother John, see him. Um, and then do this. Take a trip and go to the Philippines. Just go. I said a year or so ago, a little over a year ago, I said to our church in one of our messages, one of my greatest regrets as a parent is that I didn't take my kids on a missions trip. One of our church members latched onto that, and he and his son are going to Zambia this fall to spend some time with Johannes. Not any sponsored trip. He's just been picking up extra jobs and making extra money so that he can take his son on a missions trip. You don't need a church-sponsored trip to go to the Philippines or to go to wherever you want to go. We've got a number. Look around this room. Pick a country. We've got a missionary there. I'd, I'd go if I were you. It's my greatest, one of my greatest regrets as a parent is not getting my kids to the mission field. 
um, you can do that. You can go. It's not hard. It's not scary. One of your suitcases needs to have backup food in it so that in case you don't run anything that's edible, you've got your food with you. We had a lady years ago went in our, uh, she went on a mission trip to Africa. I think they went to Ethiopia and Zambia in that same trip. One of her pieces of luggage was nothing but food, just in case. It was, wasn't it, Nikki? That, that, that was dedicated for her. You can go. You can go. And God can do some great things in our hearts as we'll see the world the way he does. Thanks for that report tonight. Thanks for that challenge from John 15. It's been worth it to come to church on Sunday night. Uh, pray for Amber. We'll get to see her, Lord willing, sometime next year. She moves next month, right? March? Oh, May. She's moving in May to Papanga, and she'll begin her, what she's considering kind of an internship with Brother Ferguson at that large, at that large orphanage. Um, this has been burning in Amber's heart for a number of years. And so it's getting, it's getting real for her. She's getting to put some hands on things that she has seen uh, only in her mind and in her heart. She's going to start to get to put some hands on the, the orphanage ministry there. And so pray for her. Pray for Rusty and Lita. Their, their church body is not much bigger than ours. It's a little bigger than our church, but their ministry in their large city in Lipa City is expansive. Pray for them. Pray for Knapp and Shirley Donato, Napoleon and Shirley Donato. We've partnered with them for a long time. Pray for the churches that they minister to and the men that he is mentoring. Uh, now you heard tonight how to pray specifically for some of our missionaries. Let's do that, all right? Let's stand and be dismissed in prayer tonight. God bless you for coming. Come Tuesday, or Wednesday night, we'll continue our study in Titus. Um, get by and meet the Williams family and greet them tonight and uh, find out how you can pray for them as well. We're glad that y'all stopped in, and thank you for, for being here. Father, it's been good to be in your house. We thank you for uh, this report tonight, to see your grace as it's being demonstrated in the Philippines, to see brothers and sisters in Christ that are doing over there what we're doing here. They gather together, they sing, they worship, they give offerings, they open your word, and they tell people around them about Jesus Christ. It's the same thing going on in the Philippines as going on here. Help us to do what we can to enable them to continue that. Lord, it was so good to see uh, the bio of the Philippines and these 30-plus pastors that have churches back in the mountains, places we're never going to see, we're never going to go. And there they are faithfully uh, preaching your word and serving your people. Bless them for it. Uh, we're especially excited to see what you're doing in Amber how you're growing her, and how she is flourishing in, in the Philippines. Lord, continue to bless and protect her and bless uh, the direction that she is going with your good hand of provision and instruction. Thank you for putting the Fergusons in her path so that she can go and learn from them how to minister to these millions of kids in the Philippines who are without parents. Lord, help Amber to introduce them to the one heavenly father that can change everything about them. Thank you for the burden that you've put on our church and thank you for those who, Lord, have caught the vision of world evangelism. And we pray that we'd be faithful to do here what our missionaries are doing elsewhere and that's telling people around here in Jeff City and our surrounding counties about Jesus Christ. Bless us this week with your good hand. We pray that you take these families home. Um, Lord, and this week when we meet people who you've intersected with us, you've put in our path to share Christ with them, or maybe it's a brother and sister who just needs encouragement. Help us to be ready to be tools in your hands in doing those things. We love you, Jesus. We can't wait to see you one day face to face, and we pray that that's going to be soon, and we pray this in your name. Amen. God bless you, church.